Hello, you're watching Successful Conversations with me, Vicky Paul. If you don't know me, I'm an intuitive artist and author, and I'm passionate about soul reconnection and transformation. And I wanted to set up a series of interviews with inspirational people about their spiritual journey and how they came to be living their soul purpose. These conversations are designed to lift a lid on some of life's big questions, inspire you and help you become the person that you were born to be. And I am delighted to have the wonderful Donna Hay as today's guest. And Donna is the founder of Wild Woman. You may have seen this on social media, but it's the UK's first subscription box for non-fiction books. And I'm gonna get her to share all about it later on in the conversation. But first of all, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. Um, I notice you're a curly girl like me too. Yes, I am. I'm very wild today. <laughs> no, I don't know what mine's doing, but it's just... It's Feels like fab. Love yeah, it. It's a bit of a bird's nest, but hey-ho. Um, and yeah, I was just explaining to Donna that we're in the middle of a house renovation. So I've currently tried to create a fabulous and inspiring backdrop for this conversation, but I'm in the middle of uh, boxes all round about me. So... Anyway, um, before we jump into Wild Woman, what I'd love to do and what I, I aim to do with these conversations is for them to take the, the process of my book, How to Be Successful, and it starts off with the understanding, which is really the point in your life when it was either a, a situation, an experience, a person, something happened that made you realize life as you know it or knew it had to change. So could you just please share what that was? Yeah, so I think I think actually it's interesting listening to you say it like that because I feel like you can have those moments throughout your life at different points. It's really interesting at the point that I'm in at the minute, and maybe we'll speak about this later, I feel like I'm at another one of those points right now. But in the very beginning, way back when, um, I was working in a big digital marketing space I worked for an agency I had this dream and aspiration from a very young age that I wanted to be you know the kind of woman that was suited and booted was in her high-rise apartment was wearing her Le bon uh, Christian Labontus to work every day that's how I wanted to be I thought that was success for me I thought that was a symbol of success and I so I very quickly when I came out of university I had various different jobs and I always knew that I was headed to a big career, big shiny career, media career, advertising career. And um, so I, I got this job in this digital marketing agency and, and quickly I, basically my life became work. Mm -hmm. And I was at my desk and I was cutting my lunch breaks and I wasn't taking breaks. Then I was, you know, I was constantly doing, doing, doing. And I, you know, I was really good at my job. I did really well. Um, marketing's always come quite naturally to me. And I was part of some really exciting processes and initiatives that we did as a whole company. And for a time, I loved the pace of it and I loved the fastness of it. And I loved, you know, all of the different meetings and going here and there. And I, I loved it, really embraced it. And um, outside of work, I was finishing late. So I was getting home late. I was eating my dinner and I was going to bed. And then I'd do it the same the next day. And by the time Friday came, I was kind of like, oh, it's Friday, I'll go for drinks after work. And then Saturday comes and you feel a bit like fuzzy in your head because you've had drinks the night before. <laughs> before you know it, it's Saturday night and it's all about sitting down to watch telly, getting a takeaway. And then really, I guess over a period of time, I was realizing the only free day I had or free moment I had was like a Sunday afternoon. But I was kind of mentally preparing myself again, you know, to get on Monday morning. So I was, I was in this like hamster wheel of nine to five life, um, which is great for some people. I feel like I should put that out there and say that for some people, it is absolutely the thing that keeps them going. I guess for me, I always knew that I had an entrepreneurial streak within me because I was always like... I always wanted to play shops when I was a kid and I was always creating little projects and I started a, a secondhand vintage charity um, shop based uh, business when I was like really young and I had all these different aspirations and things. And then um, this kind of went on for like six to seven months. And during this time, um, as a family, we had so mum and I had uh, my parents had divorced 
mum and I had moved into a, a brand new house together and uh, the family home had been sold. And then um, about six months into living in this new place, my mum's mum, she became really ill uh, with dementia, vascular dementia. And she also had um, COPD, which is a severe condition of the lungs. And it became really impossible for us to be balancing our time between my nan and home. So mum made the decision that she was going to move into my nan's house, which she did. And then it became difficult for mum to just, you know, focus on that all the time. She needed a bit of respite. So we made the decision, uh, me and her together, that we'd put the house up for rent and I would then move in with my mom and my nan. So it's three generations living under one roof. And for anybody that's ever cared for anyone with dementia, um, especially the, the early stages of it, I think that's the most difficult, can be the most difficult part of, of a uh, illness like that, because you notice the change so much in that person. And obviously three generations, you know, I was in my mid twenties at the time and um, my mom was, you know, newly single woman. And it was, it was really difficult. It's a really difficult environment so um I just carried on doing my thing getting up going to work every day coming home helping to care for my nan and then sadly in um 2014 my nan passed away and um it was like a huge relief in a way because we had cared for her for about nine months at this point it was a really intense environment it was very uncomfortable um and also we knew that she wasn't happy. So, you know, it was both really, really sad. And also it was also a bit of a relief for my mum. Um, she had lost, that was her, um, she lost her father many years prior. So for her, it was a huge period of loss because she'd lost her marriage and now she'd lost both of her parents. So we decided that we were going to up sticks and we were going to go to uh, live in Eastbourne by the beach. We were going to get an apartment right on the coast and we were going to wake up to the sea every day. And uh, the sea has always been like a real therapeutic place for mum and for I. And um, we started to kind of slowly heal through the process. And actually, during that time, we also lost my mum, lost uh, an auntie and uncle. Uh, there was various other members of the family that passed away. There was a lot of terminal illness being diagnosed and it was just a heavy, heavy place to be in. And the whole time I was really conscious that I had my focus of work, but I was there to like support mum and, you know, she was there to support me. It was just a lot going on juggle that because obviously you know and, and I know the industry that you worked in I used to work in something very similar and it's intense and and mm. there's a definite requirement to be upbeat to be on and to produce mm. you know, on a fairly consistent basis you know how, how did you juggle these two polar opposite emotional environments yeah I think uh as soon as I pulled up at work it was like I put on a different persona and I was like right here I am, I'm, you know, digital marketing executive, here I am, I leave all that stuff behind and I don't bring it to work. I was always really conscious not to blend work and life, which actually looking back now, I can see that's probably where I went wrong. <laughs> um, and then um, another, another kind of six, seven weeks went by and uh, I was at home, um, I'd just gone to bed, it was really late at night, got a text from my friend, to say, oh my goodness, have you heard about our friend? I won't say his name. And um, I was thinking, what do you mean? So I was on WhatsApp, like checking when he was last online. And uh, I phoned her straight back and um, he'd committed suicide, which was a huge, like, this has to be a joke. Like, this cannot be right. Um, and I remember, like, waking my mum up and telling her and then thinking the next morning well I need to go to work I can't like I can't be grieving I need to go to work I've got I need to show up and I remember going to work that day and I got into work and I didn't say anything to anyone I sat down at my desk and the office manager who'd become quite a good friend of mine she was really intuitive and she just came over to me and she said are you all right do you do you want a moment and that was it I was like I cannot cope like this, this has happened. I don't know how to feel about it. You know, when you have experienced a friend that that, that has happened to, it's very, 
your first instinct is I why couldn't I have done something why couldn't I have helped him or why why couldn't he have turned to me or you know and it, you go through all sorts of emotions when that happens and um in the weeks that followed that I realized looking back through just through photos on my phone of um the months before this had all happened that in every photo of myself it was like I'd lost the the shine and the glitter in my eyes and I'd lost my own identity I'd become so conditioned into this performance mode and going for success that I'd lost the root of who I was um and I realized through the loss of my friend that I had not had a conversation about my mental health or even thought about my mental health or prioritized my self-care at any point in the last 18 months. But actually what it was showing me was that my body was tired, my mind was tired and I needed, I needed help. And I, I needed to confront that and be really honest with myself that if this wasn't the biggest wake up call to turn things around, then could I be headed in the same direction? And I'll be completely honest and say that, yeah, I think if I hadn't have realized that at that moment with all of the grief that I'd gone through with, you know, my parents splitting up after being together for 35 years, it wasn't just, all I kept doing was putting a sticky plaster over it. And that is not the right way to deal with it. Like I needed to rip that plaster off and I needed to like get some proper antiseptic on there and I need to let it heal. Mm -hmm. I wasn't like, the plaster wasn't going to cut it anymore. And it was really, really difficult for me to admit that because I knew that meant I needed to have difficult conversations at work with friends, with my partner, with, you know, everything needed to change. Mm -hmm. Um, And then it all changed. (laughs) Which must, you know, and it's, I mean, this is what I, I, you know, wax lyrical about for everybody who's watched these on a regular basis and and follows me on social media. This is what I say. It's the very essence of my book. You know, we follow someone else's path for our own life 90% of the time. You know, yes, there are people that it works for, as you alluded to earlier on, but so many people follow somebody else's version of what their life should look like. And, Mm -hmm. And I'm not suggesting that what happened to you is going to happen to everybody, but everybody that I've spoken to about this process, something pretty major happens in their life for them to go, Mm. right, enough's enough. And, you know, brushing everything under the carpet and having to perform all the time, you know, is is such a challenge. And Mm. the fact that you did what you did for the length of time that you did without any physical repercussions to your health I mean it is is a miracle quite frankly given the amount of grief Mm. and loss that you went through Mm. so and I'm sorry for that you know and I I thankfully have not experienced suicide and and such a a close uh, nature but I I have good Mm. friends that have Mm. um, and and it's a a, a tragic a tragic thing Um, however I always think that and you know I'm going to put it out there having been through my own grief process, there's always something positive to come out of something tragic. And it might take a period of time. And if you're going through this process at the moment, stick in there because there's always, there's a reason for all of it. Mm. And it's always a savior. Mm. So, which takes us nicely on to the next sort of stage in the book, How to Be Successful, and in these interviews, the process. So that was what happened to you, which is pretty major. What was the process? How did that unfold? What did that look like for you? Because like you say, it's very difficult to step up and take responsibility. We might know that, oh God, we should be doing this, or this behavior is not healthy, or this is not gonna last for much longer. I can't keep going much longer, but we push, 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 push ourselves because really not that we want to hurt ourselves any further it's that we really don't want to step up and take responsibility it's kind of like a dirty word and oftentimes we are forced into taking responsibility rather than come to it easily so how did you manage that process and what did that look like for you Mm. so um it started off really by looking back at those photographs of me and realizing that I had lost connection to myself I didn't recognize the person that was in the photographs. Um, And I knew that there was so much 
that I was carrying on my shoulders, like the heaviest backpack in the world. And I knew that I needed to like empty the backpack and I needed to sort through it. But for me, I was so confused about how I felt. I went through a feeling a lot of guilt for how I felt because I felt guilty about, I felt, I don't really know how to describe this. I felt guilty for grieving Mm -hmm. and I felt guilty for like taking up the space because I was grieving and maybe that other person was not grieving in the same way I was. I felt like I needed to support everybody else and not myself. And, you know, that there, there, there lies a problem too, you know? So I think at the time I was so caught up in my head that I just didn't have the words to articulate how I felt. And I knew if I went to sit in front of a therapist, a counselor, they were going to ask me how I was feeling. And I was going to find it really difficult to tell them how I was feeling to express that. So um, I remember just sitting at my laptop and of course I was sitting on my laptop um, looking up alternative therapy because I'd heard this term be sort of batted around here and there, alternative therapy. Um, So I thought, well, I'll try that. I'll have a look and see if there's anything going on in my local area because it was convenient for me for it to be on my local area. I needed somewhere that I could, you know, was going to start maybe at seven so that I could get home and go. Um, It wasn't going to interrupt my day-to-day work. And I signed up for a, it was an MBCT course, which is a mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's like an eight-week course or six-week course, I think it was. And I had no idea what to expect. I just read the description and it said that I was going to learn how to meditate and it was going to really help me in my body. So I thought, well, I'll start with how I'm feeling in my body, maybe, and then it will help my mind. And I went to this, uh, I went to the first session and I turned up with my yoga mat under my arm and I was in yoga leggings, like full on yoga gear. And the, one of the instructors or the teachers in the class was like, oh, the, the yoga class upstairs. I was like, no, no, I'm not here for the yoga. I'm here for the mindfulness. And she was like, oh, okay, well, come in here. And I was like, do I, do I need my mat? And then I obviously walked in and saw everyone sitting in a circle in chairs, like in their jeans and t-shirts, like casual stuff. And I was thinking, oh, wow, I've got this so wrong. Um, and I remember like the very first session we did was about eating. It was a mindfulness eating exercise and you had to eat this raisin. Now, I don't really like raisins anyway. And I had to like really tune in to how this raisin was feeling in my mouth and the taste and the sensation. And honestly, I thought this is a load of baloney. Like I do not eat my food like this. I don't have time to eat my food in this way. I just eat it and I go. Um, And for about the first like three or four weeks, five weeks, I resisted it completely. I didn't do the homework. I didn't want to. I wasn't interested in the exercises. I didn't want to. And then in, I think it was either week five or six, we did this. um, It was like a full body scan. It was like 40 minutes, deep meditation. And I don't know what happened that evening, but I obviously just completely let go and surrendered to the experience was very in the moment. Obviously it was a mindfulness based uh, course. And um I had the most, like, I can't even describe it now, like weird sensations in my body. Like I had pins and needles and I felt like somebody had literally just come up to me and taken the rucksack off and left with it. And I felt really like light. I felt airy. I felt a little bit like how I would have felt when I was a kid, like just on my bike, you know, cycling. Like I felt really free. And um, I thought, oh, well, I'm not sure that could be a coincidence. I feel like that. So maybe I should persevere with this and maybe I should, you know, catch up with the exercises, do some of these journaling things. I'd always kind of kept a diary, but it was more like, what have I done today? Or memories, you know, it wasn't really like tuning into how I was feeling. Um, So uh, at the end of the eight weeks, I uh, was given a book by my teacher which was uh, the monk who sold his ferrari by robin sharma and she said i don't know why but i feel i need to give you this book i feel it would really help you um and for anyone that doesn't know the monk who sold his ferrari it's basically a story about um 
a lawyer, I think he's a lawyer, and he collapses on um, the floor of the courtroom like one day at work and he's completely burnt out, burnt out. And all he's done is work, 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 work. So obviously she saw the synergy in me and he had all this stuff that he needed to deal with. So he goes off and he sells his Ferrari and he goes off to become a monk is essentially the story, but I won't spoil it. It's an incredible book, read it. Um, And I like inhaled that book. Like I read it so quickly because it spoke to me. It was like, it was like magic on those pages, really speaking to me. And I was, it was almost a little bit like, is this, again, is this a bit of a joke? Like is somebody, has somebody set me up here? Like is, is Robin Sharma even an author? Like is, have I just been, is this made up? Is how I felt. And um, obviously it's not, like he's an incredible author that written loads of books, but I didn't know that at the time. And I thought, wow, I've always read and I've always loved books, but they've always I've always read fiction and they've always just taken me off to another place. It's been an imaginative experience. I didn't realize that you could read a book and f- get the feelings that I felt when I read The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. Um, and then slowly I was like, well, I need to experience more of this. So off I went to Waterstones and stood in front of the self-help section, which is never a section that you would have spotted me in before because I would have thought self-help means I am failing means I am not successful. So many people do. You're not alone in that. Yeah. There's a real, there's a real stigma Mm. attached to it. I think, I think we're slowly turning things now, but I was there and I do remember that there was a couple of people who were much, much older than me looking at books in the store thinking, why, why is she standing in front of that section? Like what's wrong with her kind of thing. They probably weren't thinking that at all, but at the time that was my judgment and I started to read, um, at the time it was quite a lot of Hay House books mm. um, and Hay House are really well known for mind, body, spirit books. And there was one particular book, which was called uh, She Means Business. It's by an author called Carrie Green. And it was, it felt kind of like the next stage of self-help for me because it was kind of business. It was a little bit of spirituality in there and it was blending everything together. And I, again, loved it. And I went to um, a Hay House conference. It was like in a full day uh, seminar just because I wanted to experience uh, a talk given by Carrie Green. And um, then consequently, it was at that talk that I'd taken mum along with me that I met uh, another of their authors called Mel Wells, who's written an incredible book called The Goddess Revolution, um, which my mum brought for me. And she didn't speak to me on the way home because she was reading her copy. And I thought, well, that must be a good book. Really, really resonated with her. And she said, please, please, please read that book, Donna. Like, I feel like you really get a lot from it. And The Goddess Revolution is about how our relationship with food can often give us, um, can often open up realizations about how we, how the relationship we have with our life. And I didn't ever think that I had a bad relationship with food. However, now on reflection, I see that the way that I was eating food and the way that I was consuming food was a, a reflection of how I was living my life. It was, I was, it was fast paced. So it was fast food. It was convenient. So it was snacking. Um, and I wasn't really thinking about what I was actually, what I was actually putting in my mouth. Um, I was kind of resenting it really. And um, that then led me to going on a retreat with the author, um, Mel, to Bali. And going to Bali was like, I guess probably Bali was my real spiritual awakening because if you've ever been to Bali, it's an incredibly spiritual place. Um, I had these moments when I was in Bali that were so peaceful and so raw um I'd never never in a million years would you have sat me at a table with a group of strangers Mm -hmm. telling my life story and I remember day one of the retreat and we all went around in this circle and we all shared our story and I was the whole time I was sweating because I was thinking I don't have a story like this is going to be embarrassing I don't have anything to say and everyone was crying and I was thinking oh god I'm in the wrong place this is just this isn't right for me um, and I remember it 
it got to me and Mel said, so Donna, tell us about yourself. And I just remember crying and crying and crying and thinking, apologizing for, for crying. Cause I was like, I don't know why I'm crying. I just feel like I need to release something. And then, you know, I was sharing about uh, the grief that I'd experienced and the pain that I'd felt when my parents had split up and the difficulties I was having in my relationship and lots of things came out. And I, again, I felt so held, I felt so supported by this group of women. And I realized for the first time in my life that we are all the same. Like we've all been through really shit times. We've all experienced different things. Nobody else's trauma is bigger than somebody else's. Like we all deal with things differently, but we're all humans and we, it's really healthy, really healthy to express how we truly feel and to release that out of our bodies. Because I think then it was interesting. You were saying earlier about had I had any physical symptoms, I didn't think I had, but I realized that I had because I was suffering with irritable bowel syndrome. I was, um, I was having tests before I'd even experienced the loss of my friend, which was um, checking my reactions because I was getting pins and needles and headaches it was all stress and anxiety building up in my body, but I, I wasn't connected to myself at all. So I didn't even realize that that's what my body was trying to tell me. For people who communicate and, and are you know linked globally through the internet, social media, it's incredible how unconnected we are and how lacking communication we have with mm. our own intuition, our own soul self the center of who we are and it's interesting how old are you i'm 32 32 so you're a bit younger than me um <laughs> and what i find interesting because you are that sort of generation that probably i would look in and go okay well you guys are talking a hell of a lot more you're expressing your feelings because you look back through your parents their parents the generation generation you know nobody talks about feelings which is why we all struggle to actually articulate how we feel because we know the word. And I, and I really resonate when you talked about that because I had the same, same journey, you know, we're all the same, our journeys are all the same, but with their own mm -hmm. special sprinkle on them. Yeah. But connecting with um, my feelings and, and the one that came up for me was passion. Mm. And I had no passion, you know, I knew what passion meant, the dictionary definition of it, but I couldn't relate the word passion to a feeling inside me and what happens. And that was a massive realization for me that when we go into protection mode, your story was obviously the situation with your um, your nan and your mom and your parents. We all have our own different situations. You go into lockdown pr pr protection mode and what your body does is instead of feeling all the horrible, shitty feelings, it just stops all the feelings. Mm. And then if you spend too long in that place where there's no feelings, it's this kind of numb, you will completely lose connection with what feeling is. And you just don't know how you, so it's really interesting that, um, and this is why I love these conversations, because as you say, it's just the realization that every single story is the same. It's just told in such a different way because you've got your own individual experiences on it. Um, and wonderful that you um, were able to share in that environment. And it's so important. And, and you know, there's there's amazing people doing amazing work. I, I know Mel Wells work well. Um, so she's doing some fabulous stuff. So. When you had that experience in Bali and you recognise, okay, what the heck's been going on and, and you started to kind of re reconnect, I was going to say realise that you weren't connected, but to, to reconnect with yourself and, and feelings. Yeah. Because for me, you know, I know you talk about the fact that wild women, which we'll get to, is, is you living your purpose. I think so many people feel that purpose is a thing. It is a, a job or it's a, a, a you know, a, a physical thing that we mm. deal with using all our, our, our five senses. It's actually not. It's a feeling. Mm. The soul yeah, purpose is, is a feeling. And, and how you get to that feeling and, and whatever it is you do that makes you feel that way, that's mm. your purpose. And, and mm -hmm. that could be a million different things. So it all filters back down to a feeling. So I guess it makes sense that, you know, you do what you do. But before we jump to that very sort of briefly what was the the process so you come back from Bali what happened uh it's funny because people um I, th I think because it's been like 
uh, three years, actually. Actually, three years to the day that I came back from Bali. Yeah, three years to the day. <laughs> and um, it used to be that, like, a, about a year, a year, two years ago, it would be Donna before Bali and Donna after Bali. And now everybody just knows me as, you know, Donna. <laughs> uh, there was definitely a transition. Not only did I come back with more tattoos than I left with and a great suntan and these amazing friends. And I felt like I'd left a lot in Bali that I didn't need anymore. I'd left it there. And I just did you felt... It, well, did you find it easy to re-enter normality? Because I also went to Bali, like you had a number of different experiences and, and went to Bali. But I found it difficult to come back. Not difficult, but there was resistance to coming back. Yeah, so... Real life is like, I can stay here forever. This is how my life is supposed to be, you know, beaches and cool people and, you know, (laughs) healthy and just helping people and this is amazing vibe. And it's like, how do you translate that into the United Kingdom where it rains and we've got to do the nine to five and we've got to save up money and get a mortgage and rah! Yeah, I think I held on to it for a long time, you know? Mm -hmm. And I felt, um, I just felt really connected to myself. And I felt like, do you know what, Donna? You've been in an environment for 10 days where you've been completely yourself. You haven't felt like you've needed to put on a front for anyone else. You've just let whatever emotion comes up, come up. You've just been however you want to be in that moment. And people have accepted you. Like, There's nothing wrong with you. Um, just be yourself. So I think for, for a good like 12 maybe yeah about 12 months I'd say I felt like I was really in line with everything and I would say especially over the last year not that I've lost that but more that I have to remind myself quite a lot Mm -hmm. that that is still there and she's still there and I am that person because of course where we're at now in this situation has taken away a lot of freedom and things that we experience and a big thing for me that I continued doing when I came back from Bali was gathering with people in person and feeling that energy and supporting people in a face-to-face basis like I I I absolutely thrive off that that's where I get most of my energy and it didn't really affect me for maybe the first three to four months of lockdown, but we're like nearly 12 months in now. And I am craving connection, real connection with real people. <laughs> I think you're not alone in that. You're, you're not alone in that. I, I never thought I'd see the day that I would long for a, a, a concert or a pub that's rammed with people. Oh, yeah. Empty armpits. I don't care. Bring it on. You know, it's just, and I and I hate, and I understand why people do it, but I, I'm like you, I, I'm a real people person and, and struggle not being plugged in and not vibing off other people. And, and you know, even the tube, I, I, it always kind of crossed my mind in London. We lived in London for a bit, the tube, it was kind of dangerous to have all these people in, but it never really bothered me because yeah. I just thought, oh, we're all these people on the planet. And, and it's, it's interesting I, I, find, I don't know how you find it and we're kind of digressing slightly, but, you know, we'll talk about lockdown because it's very prevalent. But it, I find it interesting that people, you know, when you're walking, we've got a dog, when I go for a walk, they kind of do this mm. to walk around you. And I really hope that, you know, because I feel the minute lockdown's over, I'm like, I cannot wait to get out there again. Bring, yeah. it, on. Yeah. Bring it on. But I, I really hope that, there will be significant numbers of people that will also feel like this mm. so that we're not all like tiptoeing around one another and you know because I read something on social media that somebody was saying oh well this is wonderful it means that when we come out of lockdown we'll not have that really awkward experience of when you meet a stranger whether you give them one kiss no kiss two kiss three kiss and I'm like I miss the kissing dance mm. because it breaks the ice you know and with that human connection yeah Even the, you know, when you're that close to someone and you're like, which way are you going to go, left or right? I've noticed it um, because we're all wearing masks. You don't know if someone's smiling at you. And it's also really difficult to read people's eyes sometimes because it's not, it's just not the same. I noticed it earlier when I was in Tesco's and I thought, 
this is difficult. And then I, I noticed it even more in myself, which I think because I've been through this journey, I, I, I think I, I would say I'm quite self-aware of my feelings and emotions and, and self now, because I'm aware of the, the, the personality types in me, if you like. And I was having a conversation with somebody earlier. I had to go and collect something. And um, obviously we were outside. We were socially distanced for anyone who's wondering if we were, we were. And I, do you know what? I felt like I was in a little shell. I felt like I'd gone back in my shell a bit. And I felt a little bit like, this is weird. I, I like thrive off speaking to people and I'm normally, I'm fine. And I can be, I can sometimes seem quite extroverted. I felt so introverted in that moment because I was like, this is the first person that I've spoken to that I don't really know outside of my own house in months. Mm -hmm. And everybody's really... feeling that yeah everybody is feeling that and there's lots of interesting mem uh, memes doing the round on social media about you know me in the first lockdown me in the you know the first lockdown <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's true you, you, you don't even even to the extent I think because nobody's doing anything you know we've got nothing or we feel we have nothing to share because we're not out doing anything mm -hmm. and it's even okay well I haven't seen my friends for nine months which is tragic in itself. And we're trying to set up a Zoom and I'm like, oh God, I can't be bothered. There's nothing to say. And it's this terrible apathy mm. that we all feel. So I guess this sort of in a detour fashion brings us very nicely to Wild Woman mm. and your subscription box. And I want, you to, I want you to tell us what it's all about because I'm not going to do it justice because it's interesting to watch you. Um, and when you watch this back, you you light up when you talk about books, and it's just like, <laughs> oh, thanks. I do love I do love books. Uh, so I think for once I'd been back from Bali, and I'd I'd spoken about this book club that I kind of started pre Bali when I was in Bali, and you know I'd been speaking about how I'd, I'd at this point, by the way, I'd left um, full time digital marketing role and I'd started up freelancing working for myself which was really good for my mental health because it meant that I could choose my time and it also meant that at this point I was then starting to go to therapy and it just allowed me to be a little bit more flexible um and so when I was uh when I was in Bali I'd had this idea about you know I knew that digital marketing wasn't always going to be my thing and I knew that I had more to give and I knew that I wanted to connect people and I knew that I wanted to help people find these books which were like just like rubies in Aladdin's cave for me was the equivalent of some of these books <laughs> and Minefield, you know I, 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 we did a pub quiz the other day and I think books are the most bought thing online yeah and you think how many books are being released you know and as an author myself it's you know your book is a droplet in the ocean and, and how does that how does the good stuff filter through even with all the opportunities to share what you're doing on social media yeah. Yeah, and I think obviously it's uh, it's a very it's an opinionated thing. Um, you know, many books that I've read, other people have read and said, "Oh no, that wasn't for me," and vice versa. Uh, it is very much an opinion thing, but I think um, books can also bring people together because they you can read something and then it can make you think of somebody else, and you think, "Oh, I, I feel like you should read this book," much like when I was given the monk who sold his Ferrari. So. For me, I just wanted to do more of this, but I didn't really know how I was gonna, basically, I didn't, I didn't really know how I was gonna make a hobby, a business. Mm -hmm. And whether I wanted to do that, I wasn't really sure, but I just knew that I wanted an opportunity to explore it. And actually, ironically, the um, digital marketing company that I had worked for was organizing this day, uh, one day event all about subscription boxes. And I'd gone along with a client of mine um, because I felt like it was a really good place for her to look at expanding her business. And we went along, it was really interesting. There was like massive subscription boxes there, like Craft Gin Club and Birchbox and all of those kind of people. But there was also some small ones that were just starting out. And um, there was a couple of book ones there. And I kept thinking, oh, I'm building this community online. And there's people from all around the world that are engaging in these conversations about these books. 
maybe I could bring the book club experience into a box and then send it to, it doesn't matter where your location is. Like it doesn't matter if you don't live in Brighton, you can't come to the pub to have book club. You can experience it wherever. And I also like, I love buying gifts for people. As I mentioned, like it's my boyfriend's birthday today. And I love that whole like process of finding the gift and wrapping it and all of that. I love it. Um, I also, one of my first jobs was working in a women's wear boutique and we used to wrap everything in tissue paper and it was the whole experience. And that is really what my, what my spiritual journey, I guess, has been. It's been about the full experience of my mind, my body, my soul, everything. And that's what I wanted to put into this box. Um, So I decided on that day that I was going to do it. And I went to the next book club and I said, girls, I'm going to launch this box. I don't know what I'm going to call it. Um, and then the following week, uh, following month, one of the girls from book club had brought me uh, the women who run with the wolves um, and said, I feel like you need to read this book. And instantly I was like, well, what am I trying to encapsulate? I'm trying to help women because the statistic is that women have 21 minutes a day to themselves now I'm a big believer that we all have way more than that because if you look at your insights on your phone for sure you've got more than 21 minutes that you could spend elsewhere but even 21 minutes doesn't sound like much but you can get a lot done in 21 minutes for yourself like whether that's reading a few pages of a book or whether that's doing some journaling, or whether that's just sitting with a warm cup of tea and looking out the window and not doing anything else, whatever it is. um, What that 21 minutes, if we reclaim that 21 minutes for ourselves, what that helps us do is it helps us reclaim our own power and our own desires, and it reminds us of who we are, and it connects us back into ourselves. That's exactly what I wanted to empower women to do. So... That's then how Wild Woman launched and that's, it became the, the name Wild Woman because that's essentially exactly what it does. It says what it, it does, what it says on the tin. <laughs> and every month we send out a book and it's normally a nonfiction um, new release. It's always a nonfiction, but mainly a new release. And um, there's always a theme, like an, um, an underlying theme to each box. And, uh, what I do is I curate gifts that go with that particular theme. So for instance, this month for February is all about um, rest and sleep. So we've got some sleep um, gifts, sleep themed gifts in there. We've got a book all about resting and uh, we've done, we've done themes like confidence. We've done love. We've done um, friendship. We've done work. We've done anxiety, loads and loads of themes we've done so far. I think we're about 20, no, we must be about 37 boxes in now, I think, which is completely mad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But, um, and you also get a journaling prompt, uh, which is a way for you to expand on what's in the book. So one of the most important things with nonfiction books is it's all well and good reading these books, but it can be really, I think, my personal opinion is that it can be detrimental to your mental health if all you do is read the book Um, because we can get then really caught up in what somebody else thinks and we can see we can start to think that oh well they think that and that person thinks that and that person thinks that and that person thinks that and we completely lose sight of what we think Mm -hmm. but the most powerful thing about these books is that there is always and in my experience with the books that I tend to share there's always a question that's asked or there's always an activity that's suggested or just a golden nugget of like a phrase or a word that we can take that and then we can use that 21 minutes to maybe journal about what that's bring up for us how that is reflected in our own life Mm -hmm. and then we start to see through the power of our own handwriting you know your own handwriting on the page is is really really powerful that actually ah, that, that, there's the problem. And oh yeah, there's how I can find the solution to the problem because that, that person on that piece of paper is me. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you're, you're right. You know, I've read, I don't know how many self-help books over the years, just, you know, for guidance. And there's definitely, there was a shift in self-help books that started to include exercises because as you say, when you're in, 
a vulnerable stance where you need external guidance and you reach mm -hmm. out and whether it's for a therapist or a counselor or a self-help book or whatever it is, as you say, there's a tremendous tendency to believe that, or to by osmosis take on someone else's opinion of what you should do, which actually has the opposite effect of what the self-help mm -hmm. book should be doing. It's about empowering you. Um, and I just wanted to quickly jump back because it was really interesting that you said that you loved um, or you love wrapping presents, you loved, you worked in a retail shop and I also did that for a while and I loved gift wrapping stuff at Christmas um, and the sort of entrepreneurial things because I'm a real firm believer in our sole purpose, you know, this feeling that we want to emanate and to live in and then how that becomes manifest, whether it's a hobby or it's just a way of living or it's a career, there's always little nuggets throughout your life Mm. that are telling you this is what you love this is what you're yeah. doing this is where you find joy so if anybody's watching this and they are struggling with oh I don't know what my purpose is I don't know what the heck I'm supposed to be doing particularly now with lockdown if you've been furloughed lost your job or, or find yourself in a place where you're just like I do not want to go back to pre pre 2020 that life did mm -hmm. not work for me and this is a bit of a gift albeit wrapped up in a punch then yeah. have a we look back at what brought you joy and don't necessarily look for anything in specific just be open to oh I loved wrapping presents when I worked in that shop or yeah. I loved when uh, I was helping somebody cross the street or I loved when you know whatever it is it could be anything anything that brings you joy and just hold on to that feeling and just kind of shelf it, jot it down if you're a journaler. Um, so it's interesting that you you shared that. And I love that because it's just, it's, it's you know, when you when you take a step back, you can absolutely see all the breadcrumbs throughout yes. your life. But when you're in it, it can become very difficult. Yeah, 100%. So before we kind of wrap up and just sort of let people know where they can um, find out more about you and what you're doing, um, I'd love to just very quickly um find out just given you've had a really interesting journey you're an entrepreneur you've set up in business you've worked in the big city and the big smoke had you know all the various experiences that you've had in life and you've suffered a lot of loss um and probably more than most mm. what and this is a big question <laughs> big, okay. <laughs> okay brace myself <laughs> <laughs> has there been one defining thing learning teaching understanding realization that's just gone aha that's that's been the thing of life so far oh that is such a big question I'm sorry I've just put you on the spot there <laughs> do you know one of the best the best kind of piece of advice slash realizations that I had was when I was in Bali and we were talking about our relationship with food. And I think this is something that you can, you can look at across everything in life. And it was to imagine an iceberg. So an iceberg, uh, when you look at the ocean, if you ever see an iceberg, you see like the top of an iceberg. But underneath that, underneath the waterline is a massive like mass. So we often just see the tip of the iceberg. And that really when you think about life is we often present ourselves in a way that's like just the tip of the iceberg and there's this whole like breadth of stuff about us that lies underneath the waterline that we forget about and we just let it sink to the bottom but I think actually it's about if we're going through something it's not just looking at the tip of that it's looking at the whole iceberg and letting that whole iceberg come to the surface and, and not, not hiding away from that, not being afraid of that, because it can be like a really beautiful thing when you've let that iceberg completely thaw out and you feel much freer and lighter. So I always hold in my mind, don't just focus on the tip of the iceberg, don't I? Like focus on the bigger picture, the bigger perspective, however you want to see that. For me, that was a big, a big thing. And I've reminded myself of that so much recently because I think we're like, we're stuck in this bubble at the minute. And actually, I think it's just the tip of the iceberg for many other positive 
things to come. 100% love that and I love a good analogy I'm a visual mm. person as an artist so that just totally resonates with me mm. um, and I totally agree with you I think lockdown I don't think that's the wrong word I feel all of this is just the beginning of something mm. much better and I don't know about you but I have noticed whilst there's people doing this walking around you in the path there's a much stronger sense of community mm -hmm. and people supporting and helping one another and actually being decent human beings I mean I, I, we spoke about this before we recorded I'm in the uh, middle of renovating and having done a number of properties over my lifetime renovating properties this is the first time that I've had tradesmen in the house and again we're all masked and social distance and it's allowed in England to have people in your house to do renovation work how long are we going to keep having to put these devices <laughs> onto things? Like, ah! But they're all lovely. They're all respectful. Yeah. And I said to my husband, what's going on here? You know, everybody's so nice. And my sister sort of pointed out, well, perhaps they're just so thankful that they're still in a job and they're still able to work and they're grateful that they've still got an income coming in. And I was like, you know, that's that could yeah. absolutely be it. So yeah. I'm, I'm quite grateful for lockdown i understand that there's you know and we don't need to go into all the kind of tragedy that's around it and i totally get that but i'm kind of like you i focus on all of the iceberg and i think there's so much more to come out the back of this that will actually make everything so much better make us feel yeah. so much better about who we are there'll be so much more positive opportunity and i just yeah. always encourage people to try and remain positive switch off the bloody news for god's sakes oh yeah like, yeah get rid yeah totally get rid and spend <laughs> time reading and enjoying donna's wild woman subscription <laughs> boxes so if you um can just let people know how they can engage with you where they can find out more about um you and how they can first of all subscribe yeah, so um, you can find out all about how to subscribe and everything on our website, which is IamAWildWoman.com. Uh, people always laugh at our uh, website address, but WildWoman.com wasn't available. So IamAWildWoman.com and uh, find us on Instagram, which is just at WeAreWildWoman. And uh, we share loads over there. Thank you. And I'll also put all the details into the comments below. As ever, thank you so much for watching and a massive thanks to Donna for sharing your story. And I hope that it um, connects and resonates with you. Please feel free to share this. Sharing is caring. And don't forget to hit subscribe if you'd like to find out the next notification of my next guest on Successful Conversations.